we have been, if I can use the word brainwashed, for 30 years that carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, is causing global warming by trapping heat that should be released to the air, to the, to the uh, top of the atmosphere and leave the earth. That's not correct. Uh, we are experiencing global warming, but it has a different basis. And the, how I came upon this was rather interesting. There was a Harvard nuclear physicist who happened to be reading the New York Times uh, 2017, January uh, 27th, I think. The front page had a, a NOAA image of a thermal profile of Earth over the past 100 years or more. And he noticed a little bump right at where World War II was. So he's used to dealing with a lot of data and, and uh, taking the noise out using sophisticated curve fitting techniques. So he downloaded eight NOAA databases, independent databases, and treated them with this sophisticated methodology and was able to show that, yes, there is a peak at World War II. It's, it's a, a, a real peak. It's a robust feature. And his interpretation was that, that human activity at that time caused global warming. Well, when I saw this, it, it just lighted a spark. And here's the reason. Carbon dioxide lives in the atmosphere for decades, if not hundreds of years. So why would you have a peak that just dropped off? Uh, and I know that particulates fall out of the atmosphere in a very short time. And so I started looking into that, that, that maybe this is caused by particulate pollution. Now, you know, during World War II, I mean, the, the factories were going full bore with no uh, suppression of the smokestacks. There was immense vehicular activity. The munitions were vast numbers of munitions. Whole cities were being burned and demolished. I mean, Lots there were combustions in the air. And so, of course, when the the hostility ceased, the particulates would fall out of the air and presumably the global warming would cease. So it then became the question of what is it that particulates do to the atmosphere? Now, the climate scientists, they're all over the place with particulates. Some think they cool the earth. Some think that in certain instances they might it. Others think, well, they'll change the thermal profile of the atmosphere without understanding what that means. But I had considered the problem of convection with respect to the Earth's fluid core. There, there's problems there. And uh, the, one of the problems is that for convection to take place, you have to remove the uh, the heat that you bring up efficiently. Yeah, you've shown this amazing video on your YouTube channel where if there's the ceramic plate at, on top of a glass, the convection inside the glass stops occurring or is dramatically slowed down because the heat must, must escape for yes, the convection the, process to be maintained. The difference in temperature. It has to be, the, this is uh, what you could refer to as the adverse temperature gradient or just the difference in temperature. If you minimize that temperature difference, the efficiency of the convection reduces. And if the temperature difference, if there's no temperature difference, then you have no convection by definition. And so what's happening is 
the particles in the atmosphere, and this includes this includes the particles in clouds as well, water droplets in clouds, but the particles being sprayed into the atmosphere, they absorb energy, they get heated, they transfer that energy to the gas of the atmosphere. It reduces the temperature difference from the atmosphere at the surface of the earth. And so convection is reduced. So you don't get the heat removal from the earth. Now, this is, had been totally missed by the science climate, the climate science community. The reason they missed it is they operated on the basis of, of radiation only. In other words, the radiation that you get from the sun has to be completely removed, plus any radiation generated in the earth in order to have a, a stable. So they, they always worked on this radiation balance without considering the whole concept of convection. Now, it, it doesn't, they, people like to make models. I don't, because you can make models do whatever you want. And with convection, it's immensely complicated because you've got air currents, you've got uh, all sorts of things can make it complicated. But the principle is illustrated by that little laboratory demonstration with the tile covering the beaker. That holds in all instances of thermal convection. And so what's, what's happened is, and there's, uh, there's abundant evidence that this is the case. For example, Mount St. Helens was uh, 1980, volcanic eruption in Oregon. The, uh, the plume was mostly in the troposphere. And as it passed overhead, some people made measurements. And what they found is, yes, it blocks sunlight. And so the maximum temperature in the daytime was reduced. But they also noted that the temperature at night was not reduced, it was raised, okay, because it was blocking the heat loss. Now, when I first came to California from the East Coast, uh, I learned very quickly, if you go to a, a barbecue or an outdoor party at night in California, back in the 60s, you took along a coat even in the summer, because when the sun went down, the earth would lose heat rapidly and it would get cold. That's not the case anymore. Because of all of the particulate spraying, the night doesn't cool off nearly as fast or as greatly. You see the same thing in the desert. On a, on a uh, sunny day, Oh, it's very hot during the day, but at night it's very cold. On a cloudy day, it's not so hot during the day, but the night isn't nearly as cold. And the loss or the less heat loss at night is what is driving the global warming that we're seeing. And it's caused by the particulate pollution. So it's particulate pollution, not CO2, that is the cause of global warming. Very interesting. So this particulate act like a cover that will block entry of lights during the day or exits of light during the night, and ultimately it keeps the heat on one side. It acts like an incident. Yes, it's like putting a, a, a thermal blanket up there. And so this is... This is, uh, there's a different evidence for this. For example, uh, certain cities where you have a lot of smog, you have this, and pollution, you have the same effect on a more local scale. You, you have, uh, you have uh, the heating because you have the particulates above the, the city. Uh, well, this is, the this is part of the story 
I mean, this is this is the story. There's no such thing as CO2 caused global warming. CO2 is minimal for us uh, to do this. This is this is far far more uh, dramatic. Now, what you also have is you have the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, hundreds of scientists all producing work that supports the idea of CO2. Does any single one of them ever mention the ongoing geoengineering, the adding particulates to the region where clouds form? No. Now, how can you try to claim that you are studying the Earth's climate when you are have your blinders on and you refuse to see what people are, in fact, doing to the planet? So now it becomes a question of fraud. The IPCC is saying, you know, we have to reduce the use of fossil fuels. We have to provide a lot of money for what they're doing. And at the same time, there's an international program which must be managed by the UN to be international putting particulates in the air to cause global warming. So on one hand, the UN is causing global warming. And on the other hand, it's saying, oh, no, it's carbon dioxide. Can't be both ways. So this, this is, this is a, a scale of fraud that is immense. And it's involving governments. It's involving the United Nations. And the worst part is it involves all of these scientists who refuse to tell the truth.